It was just about two weeks ago, one of those rare days that there was nothing on the calendar. A leisure day, our first appointment was 7 p.m. in Loma Linda, California. Around about 1.30, I said, well, dear, it happened to be a Friday. And I said, we best get going. Traffic can be good, traffic can be bad. We left here at about quarter after one, close to 1.30, we actually got on the road. We were going to a dedication service for my niece, who currently is in medical school in her first year. And knowing how traffic can be in LA, uh, it's just one of those things. We had a purpose, we had a destination, and we were going to be on time. Oh, you're already smiling. <laughs> you already know how this story goes. Somewhere around Pasadena, the other 50,000 people in front of me, I don't mind if they're behind me, it's a character development that God is working out in my life. They should be behind me, not in front of me. The Bible says, get thee behind me, <laughs> not in front of me. Going 35, 40, 30 to 45 miles an hour, we had covered about 25 miles. We were in good shape. It was 2.30. And we went just hurtling in to a three mile an hour traffic pattern. One hour went by, two hours went by, two and a half hours went by, and I'm going, at this rate, we'll be lucky if we get there for the benediction, if we get there at all. There was something unusual, though. Somewhere around mile marker, probably 32, we were all speeding down that interstate at four miles an hour. When I hear this diesel horn in the background, just blaring away, and I'm wondering, is he right behind me? I look in the rearview mirror, I don't see him. He's in the other lane a couple, of, uh, a couple of cars back, but he lays on his horn about four times in three minutes. And I'm scratching my head and I'm going, now let's see, he's going three miles an hour, and he wants somebody to get out of the way. Where in the world could he be going any faster than I am? I had a purpose that day. I had a destination. I wanted to be there. Get out of my way. Now, my co-pilot, my navigator, sitting next to me was even getting a little bit of anxiousness. I looked at the next exit and I thought surface streets can't be any slower than this except for the fact that there's 10,000 people before me that are on them. So I just patiently settled in and put the car into very low gear. And uh, four and a half hours later, we covered the 90 miles to get to our destination. Character development is what I call it. I, all, I also call it a delay in reaching your destination or your purpose. Sometimes we wake up in the morning and we go, God, what do you want me to do that day? Some of you are very serendipitous in your relationship with God. You wake up new, a new day before you, and God, what do you want me to do? Some of you are wired linearly. You knew from the age four what you wanted to do as an adult. And when you became an adult, you did that, and you continued to do it. Some of you are somewhere in between. And for some of you, you perhaps haven't given a lot of thought about purpose in life. It just kind of comes to you day by day. Wouldn't it be nice if God would just lay it out in a book and deliver it to us by email or instant messaging? Here is your purpose for today. At two o'clock, you have this appointment, followed by three o'clock, and when this issue comes up, Here's how you should handle it. I'd like to have that type of direction. How about you? Most of the time, we live our lives in what I, what I would uh, categorize as transitory purpose. 
kind of in the moment. That's not good or bad. That's not uh, to be avoided because life comes to us that way, day by day and week by week. But I'd like us to turn to John chapter 12 because I find in John chapter 12 uh, some stories about purpose of life, an enduring purpose. An enduring purpose is different than transitory purpose. Enduring purpose is that which is longer, uh, longer stream in our life. It has been said uh, by Henry Ford when he was developing his cars um, that there were those who wanted transportation. And he understood what they wanted was faster ways of transportation. Some of those people thought that, they, that what they wanted were faster horses. He developed a car and understood sequentially, it is the issue of transportation and not the modality that is long-term and enduring. And as Christians, sometimes we look at methodologies, sometimes we look at temporary purposes as that is the purpose that needs to be embraced, as opposed to looking at the enduring purpose that Christ might have for our life or the life of our church, or the life of our churches, plural. So in John chapter 12, there are, there are at least three or four characters, and I'd like to look at them today with, uh, from the theme of what, uh, what were their purposes in the time that they were living, and see if any of those purposes apply to us. At first, they seem to be somewhat disconnected. When I read this passage in John chapter 12, I didn't read this as a, a passage of speaking of purpose primarily. And then I read it again, and about the fourth or fifth reading, as I'm accustomed to doing, I started picking up the verbs in this story, started looking at the characters in the story. And when I got to the end of the chapter, where Jesus was speaking, I found his purpose. So in this instance, we're going to go to the end to find purpose that we might then go to the beginning to see how the chapter developed when it concluded with Christ. Okay, are you with me so far? All right, so open your Bibles, please, to John chapter 12. And there's a reason that we go to John chapter 12, because Jesus' purpose in John chapter 12, verses 44 and 45. In, in verse 44, Jesus cried and said unto him, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. He that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. Jesus' purpose, as we, as we look at this passage from 45 to 50, Jesus' underlying purpose Enduring purpose, wherever he was, whatever he did, was to glorify his Father. Didn't matter where he found himself, he came to glorify his Father. And he states so here as, he, as chapter 12 uh, concludes. I am, come, uh, I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to what? Save. To save the world. So we have Jesus coming as the light of the world, drawing people out of darkness, not to condemn, but to save. He that rejects me and receives not my words hath one that judges him. The same I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Now the next passage, uh, the next part of this passage is absolutely imperative that you get the context and, and the validity of Jesus' words the authority by which he speaks. For it is the same authority that comes into your life as you live for Christ and have his purpose. For I have not spoken, verse 49, for I have not spoken to myself, but whom? The Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment that I should say and what I should speak. I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, 
so I speak to you. Oh, oh, I love this passage. It is so rich. Here Jesus is saying, you know me. Some of you don't believe that I'm the Son of God. But I'm going to tell you by what authority I speak. I speak not of my humanity. I speak of the Father in heaven, and he gives me the words that I share with you. Wouldn't you like to have been there? Friends, we have that same life. We have that same spirit living in our lives today. Do you believe it? Do you believe it when you talk to somebody about the gospel? You may not be quoting it, but it comes directly from the throne of grace that at that moment you are representing the Father to those people. Oh, you they might say, oh, you know, all that religious stuff, you know, that's good for those who are re religious. Never mind. They'll see Christ working in your life. They'll hear His words coming from your mouth. The authority that you bring those words without proclaiming it is the authority of heaven. I don't care if you listen to me today. Listen to what God the Father is saying to you today about purpose. A couple things to note as we look at the conclusion. Jesus came to be light to a dark world. First, people had to look at the light. Second, he came to proclaim the words. Second, they had to hear. Third, he listened to the needs of the people. And fourth, he loved the people. If that was Christ's mission, then I like to think that the 18 million plus gathers around the world today, by simple scope, have a greater advantage than the 18 or 20 people that probably were involved in this story in John chapter 12. Can you say amen? amen? If he could work with 20 people and he could teach a lesson in John chapter 12, how much more so could he work with 150 or 200 people in the community of believers here today? His mission today is an enduring mission. His mission that he set before his disciples then is the same enduring mission that he wants his disciples to embrace today. Do you believe that? Yes. Now, the greater question, though, as we look at our own lives, we say, Lord, that must be the preacher's job. Certainly the elders of the church, they're well trained. They've been in the church a long time. They know what to say and how to say it and when to say it. But I've only been a Christian for a few years, a few weeks. The good news is the Holy Spirit will be with you as you share Christ this week. Christ's purpose was to give hope. John chapter 12. Let's look at uh, just a few characters in this chapter as we look at purpose. John chapter 12 in verses 1 and 2. Christ's enduring purpose was to give hope and life to the hopeless. I like the way this chapter opened. It's really kind of an odd thing. It really could have started probably with a third or fourth verse. But for some reason, chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 is there. Now, in order to understand the context, in the previous chapter, there's the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And this, that chapter describes that Jesus was there with those whom he loved. Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. Did you catch that? You know, if, if I read in the Bible that Jesus loves somebody, it gets my attention. Because very few places in the Bible is that ever recorded. But it got my attention because as I read in John chapter 12, at the end of this chapter, he says he came into the world not to condemn the world, but to what? Save the world. That means he loves me. He loves you just as much as every character in John chapter 12. So, John chapter, uh, John chapter 12, verse 1. There we find Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. 
There they made a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. He seems to be mentioned kind of incidentally here. Oh yeah, he's the guy that I, that was raised from the dead in the previous chapter, and let's get on with the story. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. You missed the context. If you just, you know, if you just went over that, that quickly. When Jesus goes to Mary and Martha, and he goes to the tomb of Lazarus, um, Lazarus was really in bad shape. There wasn't much hope for him. He had been dead for four days. Of all the people in the world that Jesus might talk to, and Jesus might offer hope to, um, I don't think I'd put him in the top five. He's been dead. He's in the tomb. The Bible says he was stinking. They rolled away the stone. Very little embalming, if any. And the stench came forward. Mary and Martha wondered for just a moment. As Jesus spoke, Jesus looked. He saw Lazarus. What did he do next? He spoke the words of life and said, Lazarus, come forth. The reason... <laughs> The reason I find this interesting is, hmm, let's see, if you don't believe on Jesus, word had gotten out. What does he do? He raises the dead. Where is he going to be? He's going to be at Mary and Martha's house. Well, let's go over. You slip in the side door and you look. Who's in the, who's in the living room? Wait a minute. It is indeed Lazarus. Let's see, now what do I believe about Jesus? The Jews were shaking. Their faith was crumbling. Their systems of organized uh, laws and procedures, ceremonial cleansings, were just being shaken to the core. But Jesus always comes, always comes to bring life. That may not be real good English. Whenever he comes to a person, it is to bring life, more life and abundant life at that. So we see Jesus coming to the hopeless, bringing hope, coming to those who are in spiritual darkness and spiritually dead to bring life. Next we find um, verse 3. Lazarus' purpose, he was there to glorify Christ, just to be in Christ's presence. Verse 3 in John chapter, uh, John chapter 12. Then took Mary a pound of ointment, a spicknard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then said one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why wasn't this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, and he had the bag, and he bore that which was therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone against the day of my burying. She has kept this. It's an incredible story. You like the picture on the front of your bulletin? It's incredible from so many facets. Here his disciples are gathered in the household. Of all, all the disciples, we don't find any of them. Now, if I remember correctly, most of his disciples, if not all of them, were, I think, men. And the one who had the caring spirit was Mary. Took the alabaster box, approximately a, point, a pint, a very costly Perfume, most likely, it was called nard in those days, most likely it was handed down as a dowry from one generation to the next. For where would a woman ever get something as valuable as a year's worth of salary in those days? Cherished, cherished from one generation to the next, hidden away in her household to be given to her daughter, and passed down from one generation to the next. Mary, 
Mary couldn't contain herself. She probably did not have a formal invitation to the table, but she came in quietly from the side of the room. Like many people come to Jesus today. They don't want to be seen. They just want to be in his presence. They'll never preach a sermon. They just want to love him. They won't say too much, but they'll go about honoring him and glorifying him. And there there were the disciples milling around. Judah's certainly close by, and she breaks that alabaster box. And the room is filled with fragrance, and everybody knows something is happening. She came. Her purpose that day was to glorify Jesus with an open heart to bless him, to do whatever she could to honor him and worship him. And friends, let it be a lesson. When you go to glorify Jesus, there will be those around somewhere that will say, now wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Slow down a little bit. Don't be quite so excited. What are you doing so happy? Be here a few months. Some of that will wear off. You'll settle in and you'll be just like everybody else. Don't let it happen. Purpose. Mary's purpose was to glorify Jesus as she brought her all to Jesus. It was perfume of this earth that ascended to the holy feet of Jesus and on to heaven on high. And shame on those who would ever, ever, ever criticize somebody bringing an offering to Christ. And then there's Judas. I guess I would just as soon skip over his purpose, knowing the end of his story. But perhaps it's listed there just as a constant reminder. Well-meaning, misguided, by the selfishness of his heart, wanting to advance something that wasn't from the throne of heaven, but of his own making. And Jesus gently tries to bring him the words of life. Let her alone against this day of my bearing, she has kept this. Mary's purpose in anointing Jesus' feet was to be a Joyful blessing, Judas, Judas's selfish purpose was to be a curse to himself and to others. Purpose. But the story doesn't stop there. We see next the cast of characters and their purpose. The chief priests, in verse 18, the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. They were, they were conspiring to put Jesus to death. But if they only put Jesus to death, that left a problem because this guy named Lazarus was still walking around. And, uh, you know, when somebody's raised from the dead, that's real hard to explain and real hard to deal with. Because that by, by reason of many of the Jews went away and they believed on Jesus. On the next day, much people that were come in verse... Um, in verse 12, that were come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. And they took palm branches and went forth to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And they welcomed him uh, with palm branches as he came. But Jesus, Jesus came that we might have eternal life. In that passage in John chapter 12, we also see a, a group of Greeks there also. They're looking. They're looking for Jesus. They've heard of him. And they come to uh, Philip and Andrew and say, tell us, where can we find Jesus? Sir, we would, we would, we would see Jesus. They heard about him. Now they wanted to see him. 
People hear about Christ, now they want to see him. Where are they going to find Christ in the world today? Let me gently suggest, some people, the only reflection of Christ that they will ever see will be the Christ that lives in your life and through your life. That's an awesome, awesome responsibility, isn't it? To think, they may read their Bible, they may not. They may have a brief encounter with you that's just over a few days. What will you bring to them in terms of what Christ looks like and how Christ treats them and how Christ loves them? Their desire was to see Jesus. And Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. He that loves his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it eternally. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will... What's the next word? My Father honor. Oh, I want to be honored by the Father one day, don't you, friends? But that comes by following. It doesn't come by accepting. It comes by discipleship. It comes by purpose in life. We go to the end of the chapter. We started there. We see Jesus claim the authority of his Father and glorified his Father. We see Christ in the middle of the chapter saying that his disciples will bring him glory as they follow him. He will present them before his Father. What an enduring purpose on behalf of Christ, isn't it? But to be included in that group, we must purpose, not with a temporal purpose of, I'll be a Christian, I'll model what Christ is to this world occasionally, or when I find it convenient, or when, when the opportunity presents itself and I'm in a good mood. That's temporal purpose. We must have an enduring purpose, a purpose that moves from day to day, week to week, a purpose that says we're instant in season, we're instant in opportunity. It has been, inst it has been estimated by researchers at the Barna Institute. Uh, let me set the context for that quote with another one. It's amazing to me how people sometimes lose days, weeks, and years of their life. Have you ever seen it? They just kind of drift through life. And it's not great accomplishments. They just don't accomplish. We, we all need downtime, so please don't, please don't misunderstand this. But when I read the statistics that the average American spends not one, not two, not three, not four, but five hours a day, Watching TV? Hmm. Now, confession is good for the soul, but I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. Five hours a day. So if you go from 20 to 70 and you have 50 years, that means 16 years, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the average American has spent glued to his TV. That which is upright, that which is good, that which is noble, probably not. A third of the life spent in front of the television. Gaining purpose, moving where, I wonder. Barna Research out of Ventura County did a survey a number of years ago, uh, both in, you know, in, uh, amongst Christians and uh, not professing Christians. And they asked Christians, how much time do you spend in Bible study? And uh, the survey results showed, they, the question was, how much time per week do you read your Bible? Now, bear in mind, the average American is 30, what do we say, 35 hours a week in front of the TV? I would like to say that Christians spent 30 hours a week studying the Scripture. I'm saddened to read the statistics that it's 53 minutes a week. Purpose. If you can't read the scripture, put it in your CD on the way to work. You're certainly in traffic that long. Some of you longer. Purpose. 
that you set before you an enduring purpose to take that which would distract you, set it aside, and focus on Christ. Jesus has promised in John chapter 12, Christ's purpose. John chapter 12, verse 32 and 33. He says, and if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. Purpose. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw how many? All men unto me. The purpose of our lives are not earthly riches, fame or fortune. They may come our way. The purpose of our life is not that which is temporal, but the purpose of our life is to honor and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. In the way that we live, the way that we behave, the way that we treat each other, that as we listen to Jesus, as we look at Jesus, as we speak, they will be Christ's words, that our lives will reflect Jesus. The characteristics, if you uh, happen to follow along in the handout, I'll just touch on the characteristics of a pur purposeful life. For those of you that um, are tactile, I'll just mention them. The characteristics of a pur purposeful life is it is intentional. It's focused. It's committed. It's practiced. It's adaptable. It's joyful. And it allows, it puts, a purposeful life puts God's people first. Friends, I don't know how it is in your life. I'm going to ask you today, as we close our time together, just to spend a few moments reflecting on your life, maybe the past few days, the past few weeks. Maybe you've gone into what I call a black hole of spirituality. Um, astronauts, they get on the other side of the moon if they're orbiting the moon. They go into radio silence where they don't get any signal. Sometimes when you go through compression, spiritual compression and detachment from the Lord, it's like, I know he's out there, but how come I don't sense him? How come I don't feel him? How come I'm not receiving his signal? It's at that time, he'll still speak by his still small voice. It's at that time the prayers of your fellow church members are ascending on high in intercessory prayer for you. Purpose, temporary or enduring. I would challenge you to focus on that which is enduring today through Christ, which will endure unto eternity. Let us pray together. Father, in John chapter 12, we see the purpose of those who you called to be your disciples. We see the sacrifice that you said was coming of giving yourself on the cross for the forgiveness of sin. We see your enduring purpose, Father, not to condemn us, but to love us as Jesus loved us. Father, we wander. We get distracted. We get delayed. But Father, that purpose that Jesus had, plant that seed in our heart that we can't plant ourselves. Take our sinful hearts our sinful lives. Make them anew, just as you call Lazarus forth, spiritually call us forth, that we will joyfully bring honor and glory to you, that others might hear your words from our lips, that they might get glimpses of your character, those on the job, 
those in our neighborhood, and in our family. We'll bring you the honor and the glory as we live on purpose with an enduring purpose to glorify you. Bless us, Father, to this end. We ask in Christ's precious name. Amen.